Welcome this afternoon to our illustrator gather. We are grateful to have Chandra Strickland and Pat Cummings gathered with us in this cloud somewhere to talk about their work. Um, special shout out to Chandra for so many things, but I wanted to take some time to say thank you for one, sharing her love of teaching with us here at the Highlights Foundation. We're hopeful that she'll be with us this fall for a workshop that we're doing in partnership with the I2 Arts mm -hmm. uh, program. And also, thanks so much, Chandra. I think some of your MICA students are probably on here, but you were a big supporter for us um, with our internship last mm -hmm. summer, and you brought us Molly and Emily and Leanne, and we're so mm -hmm. grateful for that. And then of course, for joining us for our uh, Illustrator Gathers. This has been so lovely um, to have you here. My pleasure, thank you. And we're grateful to have Pat Cummings with us. Like Shadra, Pat is an author, illustrator, and teacher. And she's helped so many people grow in this community, um, in their art, and in their prose, and in just meeting don't, great don't people. Forget, don't forget the brownies. That helps. And people. the brownies. <laughs> Actually, Pat is the person who introduced me to Shadra uh, a while ago at one of those great big SCBWI meetings. We were in a ballroom and she said, come here, come here. I want to introduce you to somebody. And uh, that was really life changing. So thank you so much for that too, Pat. Um, I was on bookshop.org today. And I noticed that you can get your hands, all of you out there can get your hands on a copy of Our Children Can Soar, a celebration of Rosa, Barack, and the Pioneers of Change, which features both art from Shadra and Pat and 10 other awesome artists. Um, so if you're looking to purchase a book, bookshop.org is a great place. It supports your local bookstores. And also you can get your hands on a book with these two in the same book. That would be great. Um, I'll say again, thank you both so much for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. <laughs> <Thank you>. Hi, <laughs> thank you so much for having us. Um, fun fact, so Pat is not only a mentor, was my mentor when I was in graduate school and has mentored so many people. So, you know, Allison talking about that meeting being life changing, like my meeting of you, Pat, is of course changed my life and I would not have been able to do it without you. So You're so talented. It's so easy. When, when somebody has a whole lot of talent, it's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it helps to have a little help. <laughs> so how's the, how's the uh, quarantine treating you? Okay, okay, don't tell anybody uh, who many, how many are on, 117, don't tell anybody. I love it. <laughs> okay, because I've always said if I just have enough time to just stay home and get some work done, I'm not actually getting as much done as I thought. Uh -huh. I think everybody I've talked to is finding that it's not that easy to get work done yeah. for some reason in this environment. Your head kind of is like twisted, yeah. but um, I, I, I don't mind it. I don't yeah. mind it. I mean, I think everybody needs to stay safe and stay indoors. For sure. So, you know, it's, it's, it's half uh, delight in being able to stay home and work and half just fear of, of stepping foot outside. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I talked to a friend of mine last night and she was like, you know, you were made for this. As an only child and an artist, like, you don't ever need to go outside again. I was like, I am living my best life right now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not good in the sense that you, there are things that had to be canceled. I sure. see um, like Cherry Mae Goldston, who I haven't met, who's in, uh, in Albuquerque. We were going to do a workshop in Santa Fe that I had to postpone. Uh -huh, so there's yeah. a lot of things that have fallen by the wayside. I know the Quelle conference was coming up. Yeah. Um, and so that is tragic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know um, but I think we're flexible and trying to figure out how to use technology, like in this instance, right, to support the community and try and, you know, bring everybody together still to talk about books and ideas. But it's a weird, I won't even say it's a new normal. It's, it's just the new weird. And I think it's going to be that way for some time. So yeah, but think about it. You know, we are really fortunate. I mean, this is just like the self ad, right? We're really fortunate to be in children's books because yeah. we already have a sense of community yeah. and we have a really strong community that is already ready to band together. If you're a plumber, you're on your own. Right. Okay. Right. You know, if you're a bus driver, you're on your own. Absolutely. Even engineers, you know what I mean? Maybe they have organizations, but I don't know if they really feel like getting together and chatting. Right. But even you know, as an artist, being able to have an outlet, you know, I think we're all so grateful to be able to sit down and draw something during this yeah. time or make something during this time yeah. instead of just 
going stir crazy or watching TV. So I'm so grateful for our community and our, our gifts and being able to share that with one another. So, yeah. yeah. So what are you, what are you working on these days? So, okay. So <laughs> Trace came out and I've started reading Trace. I started your first authored middle grade. Yeah. First one, right? First one. Ma amazing. Congratulations. It's the first one published. Not I, no, seriously, seriously, Sheila and I worked on a middle grade series for um, Hyperion. We were working on six books. We both finished a book. Okay. I mean, we were, we were deep into it. It took us about 17 years, right? I right. mean, Lisa Holton was the publisher and she would keep coming in and saying things like, seriously, seriously, you know, another year. I mean, it was taking us a long, long time. And I think when we got to the point where we had like the frozen sorcerer, um, mm -hmm. they shut it down. Okay. <laughs> we had elves, we had fairies, we had ghosts, we had aliens, we had cross-dressing teachers, you know, and yes, Thanks. that, that one got shut down. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. Uh, how, long did, how long did Trace take you? Oh my goodness. Trace took a good, maybe 10 years in terms of the gestation, because I count that. I count the time that you're spending thinking, right? Yep. Um, a long, maybe good 10 years ago, I think I saw something on Oprah mm -hmm. or I saw it in the news. I know I saw it on YouTube because I went and checked on YouTube about an accident that had happened. Mm -hmm. I'm really drawn to things that are mysterious or otherworldly, you know, mm -hmm. and an accident had happened. A man had uh, driven his car off of a bridge into a river and it started to submerge. It was a late model car and so it was electrical systems that wouldn't work and everything shut down. Mm -hmm. And the windows wouldn't go down and he couldn't open the doors and he couldn't get out. And the water was coming into the car and he was going to drown. Right. And he's kicking at the windows and stuff and trying to get out and he can't get out. And at the very last minute, as the car was like almost fully submerged, somebody pulled him out through the window. Mm. And when I went on YouTube, I could see these guys in an EMT raft. There were two guys and they like, and this guy bobbed up out of the water and they pull him onto the raft, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they pulled the car out of the water, the windows are still rolled up. Wow. Right? Right. Wow. right. And so, I mean, and that just stayed with me. I just couldn't, um, that's one of those stories that you just don't forget. Yeah. And so then um, I was working on that series with Sheila and I started to do research for a story that just never got done about the, um, about the uh, draft riots in 1863. Okay. Now here's the shocker. And I want everybody within the sound of my voice to hear this, okay? I got misinformation on the internet. What? That what? doesn't happen. What? Everything is fact on the internet. What are you talking what? about? It was, not, it was not the gospel truth. So what I saw on the internet was that the draft riots in 1863 happened. Um, angry white men who were being drafted and did not want to go, who felt that they were being drafted to go save slaves in the South mm -hmm. and who had to leave their farms and their businesses and their families mm -hmm. to do so um, were, were rioting and they burned down the colored orphan asylum. Okay. Okay. Orphan and asylum? Orphans. Little kids. Orphan asylum. Is that a thing? Is that a thing? It's a thing. Are it you sure? A it didn't sound like a thing. <laughs> it was a thing. Okay. It okay. It's a thing. It was, right. a, it was a color asylum. Children's okay. asylum. Um, and so they burned it down. And it was, according to the internet, on the site where they built the New York Public Library. <laughs> so you know, you know, you know. With this little bit of misinformation, I just, I just went off. I just took uh, off. So I went, uh, well, this is bound to be a ghost. You got to have a ghost. Oof. Okay. And so the readings that I was doing, I found that there had been one child who was killed. Uh, only one. They got all the rest of the kids out. But one child was killed, and it was not from the fire. It okay. was uh, the, the crowd beat her to death, which was just horrifying. And I felt like this is a story that I want to dig into. Right. Um, and so armed with that in misinformation and the bit about the guy going off the car, off the car, off the thing, why? I don't know why your brains do what they do. Right. Uh -huh. but I thought these two stories will work together yeah. and discuss. Wow. <laughs> so that's where I started like about 10 years ago. And wow. I thought, okay, I'll put this together. Betsy Bird, who was the librarian, the new, yeah. uh, new public library, the children's librarian. She said to me, nah, that didn't happen. <laughs> and she gave me a tour of the stacks and they're very spooky down there it's very yeah. spooky underneath the public library and it goes on for a whole block and so she gives me this tour and she points out all the facts the realities and stuff and she said the orphanage was actually two blocks to the north oh. so i walked two blocks to the north and there's like a chase manhattan bank 
<laughs> and ain't, ain't nobody gonna haunt the Chase Manhattan Bank. No. That's just, you know what I'm saying? So right. I'm like, any ghost would just drift on downtown. <laughs> to the library. <laughs> yeah, so I thought, you know, I can, I can make this work. I can make this work. But uh -huh. those two stories together um, just stayed in my head. Yeah. And what I find now is, and this is for, um, like, I, I've done picture books all my life. Not yeah. all, my, all my adult life, right? Yeah. And this is so appealing. Shadra, I must say to you, come, come to I'm middle grade. I'm working on it. I, you know, Allison will tell you, I started a novel in verse that I, that I was, I want to come to highlights to work on and I got a grant to do it. So I already started writing some of the poems. Um, and then I have an idea for a kid who thinks she's a psychic <laughs> and it's, we don't know if she is or she is really bad at it yet. So I haven't decided. I started, I started writing, um, I started writing a picture book for, about a little girl who runs with her dad. And then that turned into a bigger story about her father being a police officer. And it's just this big plot unfolds, but that's as far as I've gotten. Cause I'm like, I'm not a real writer, right? I'm, I'm a player. <laughs> Never say that. You had that story about a girl. And I, all I remember, she had this colander on her head and she was like, it was an alien? Somebody was an alien. Mom's having an alien. She's an okay. only child and she sees a sonogram, yes. is convinced that her mom is having an alien. No one wants that story. I've tried to sell it since we met and no one wants that story. Nobody right? wants it yet. Yet, right. We'll see. You haven't, you haven't tweaked it yet. I mean, I've had a student who came back last semester to my class, Galia Bernstein. She was in class and she did this thing about um, a a cat and she said it took 10 years of her just every now and then going back to it and tweaking it or something and then one little thing and it and it worked and that's what happens it's like these stories sometimes they just have to gestate yeah it just takes yeah. a time you know i like everybody who writes and tries to write i've written it like four or five hundred times now <laughs> so it's it's in a box along with some other stories that will find their their day but it, i tell the story all the time with the one that i sold and i'm working on now I sat down and wrote that thing in a day and sold it in a day. And I'm just yeah. like, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Are you kidding me? That that's how it can happen. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the key is to just keep making the work and let the chips fall where they may. Right. <laughs> so what are you working on right now? So I'm working on Jump In, my first author illustrated picture book, but mm -hmm. I brought um, sketches for a book cover that I'm working on now. So I can show you all that. You want to see that? We can yes, please. Yes, please. Please. All right, let me let me figure out my um, situation. <laughs> share this. this is technology. Okay, I think I can share it in Finder. Let's see. All right, do you see? What do you see? Do you just see the cover, or do Some you see places more than others? Okay, so just this up. is Renee Watson's um, one of her not the last one, but second to last uh, middle grade cover. And so I just want to kind of talk through the process. This is one of the original sketches. So the story is about a girl in Portland who is reconnecting with her family in Harlem. And I wanted this kid like walking across the cover of the book. And I was like, yeah, I can use lots of grays and purples like Portland. And um, uh -oh. Uh -oh. technical what? difficulties. OK, what do you see now? <laughs> Let's see the cover. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share it another way. I'm going to share my desktop. Ah, okay. okay. There you go. So let me see if it'll let me zoom through. Oh, my computer hates me. Okay, well, this is the final cover that actually happened. And so we moved the character over to the right a little bit and the palette brightened up considerably. And this is bright for me because I like grays. <laughs> um, and that's the one that we'll see in the, um, in the, the final cover. So I'm still trying to figure out. Ah, uh, are you, is this all digital? This is all digital. So this is all on Procreate. Oh my God. Everybody's using Procreate. I've got to learn, don't I? It's, it's, it will change your life oh in God. great ways. Okay, let me try this. Are you still seeing the desktop? Yes, I am. Look at okay. that, all your files. Okay, here we go. So this is the final cover, and it was wow. all Procreate. This was my first Procreate, like, uh, pr pr professional thing that was published. Cool. So the UK version was this. And when I saw the UK yeah. version, I was like, man, I should have done that. You know, like the professional jealousy comes out. I'm like, mm, that's so nice. Right, right. 
why I love the colors. I'm sorry there isn't a bigger uh, picture than this. This is only like uh, I love his sense of colors. You know, I really like her outward face. I love my cover. I'm really happy with what I did. Uh, but um, it's just the juice. The juicy colors are so great for this, right? And the um, perspective I thought worked really nicely. So Bloomsbury's come back and they asked me to do the paperback cover, but they're uh -huh. asking me to like punch up the juice. So here are some sketches for the paperback. Okay. First one, second okay. one, which I, I really see. like. But this is the one that we're gonna go with, I think, that I just turned in. So very, very close to the UK version. Mm -hmm. And I had felt some kind of way about that at first, because I was like, oh, I don't want it to seem like I'm, you know, uh, cheating, right? Or, <laughs> or copying that. Um, but I got over myself real fast and I'm happy with where it's going now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not that. Do you know what it means? I, for one thing, we need to be a little bit um, kinder with ourselves. 942,000 years ago, when I was living in Manhattan next door to Charles Lilly, who okay. used to do books, but he was an illustrator that did movie posters and stuff like that. I went over to his apartment. He was working on a book jacket and he had all these models that he had shot and he had a student who was drawing the pictures on a canvas. Okay. And Charles would circle things. He would say, I want the hand from this <laughs> photograph and the head from this photograph wow. you know what I mean? and the collar I mean and the student would assemble this Frankenstein of an image on the thing and I was like that's cheating Charles right it's like are you insane it's like first of all you don't think this way um in terms of um eating all my metaphors about food you'll eat anything okay Mexican Correct. Chinese Japanese you know Moroccan you, you, sure. you you'll sample everything and you feel you have access to it. Yep. The same is true with the visuals, I think, even right. though it gets kind of grisly in terms of a metaphor, yeah, when yeah. you're absorbing all these visuals. Yeah, yeah, for sure, out. for sure. It's, it, you're gonna be influenced by stuff. And that, I think that's part of the beauty of it is that we all rub off on each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You get inspired think, by something. Yeah, and I tell my students, I mean, there's a fine line between influence and um, what's the word? Um, <laughs> when you steal somebody's idea, what's that called? Procreating. Procreating. No, 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 no. Huh. It's a word we use in school. Like, don't don't steal somebody's paper and make it oh, your plagiarism. own. Plagiarism. Plagiarism. There we go. <laughs> you know, so there's that fine line. And for this, I feel like this cover experience has been a really interesting conversation between all these different visuals, right? So it's the com it's me and my yeah. ideas, yeah. the conversation with editors and then marketing. And then seeing this other artist, and now I'm back in the conversation on yeah. the, the version we're doing now. And that's really cool, but you do have to just kind of give yourself permission to be influenced and, and work within the, the conversation, I think. It's, but you know, I always feel like you want to grow. Oh, for you sure. Want to grow, and that is how you grow. It's by letting things change you and influence you. I worry about the people who don't change, yeah. who don't let something influence them. Yeah. You know, what, what, what is that? You know, like you're an island unto yourself and you got it, you got it and you know the way and that's the only way to do it. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, you got to be but, open to that. But art school will tell you, and we, we don't do that at MICA, <laughs> but in art school teaching, you get a lot of, you have to have a style. You have to have one style and that's it. And that doesn't change. And that's how you're marketable and this and that. And I don't believe that's true. Like I grew up looking at your work and looking at the Dylans and, you know, um, all these people who let the influences in. And that was so important to me as opposed to just having the one way of working all the yes. time. So. You, take, you take a look at like the Dylans are an excellent example, but somebody like Paul Zelensky. Yeah. He will do, you know, Z is for moose. Yep. What? And then do um, Rapunzel. Rapunzel or something that is like, <laughs> right. looks like, looks like museum. Maybe. Renaissance paintings. Paintings. Exactly. paintings. It's like you, your style, and this is something that Diane Dillon, you know, showed me. And Leo's always said, "You respond to the manuscript." Yeah, exactly. And so if every story was exactly the same, then maybe the style would be the same. Yeah, you could kind of understand that, but no. Yeah, and that's however, okay. However, um, at Books of Wonder, uh, Peter told me one time that the reason that some people do really, really well when it comes to reselling their art after the fact. Mm -hmm. after the book has been done is because they have a recognizable style that never changes right and that's the thing you know i tell my students like who do you want to be what do you want your life to be and your work to be and you make a decision and there's yeah. no right or wrong answer just understand 
the pros and cons of both ways of, of doing it, you know? We've been doing this since kindergarten, okay, when you thought there was a right way to draw an apple tree. Exactly. And the teacher told you, oh, that, that's not right because it doesn't look like an apple tree. And blah, 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 you know? Or it's not red. Apples are supposed it's, it's, to be red. Apples, yeah, you know, and there is no right. There is no wrong. It's just like you said, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. So what are you? I, I, think, I think it's get, I think it's coming away from that. I don't hear that at Pratt or at Parsons so much anymore. About you have to have a style. Yeah, Definitely. I think because there's so many tools available too now, like with digital work and traditional and trad digital. There's so many ways of making things that. Why would you limit yourself or limit your students into working one way? Right? There's so many different vocabularies. So, yeah. what are you working on, Pat? Coming? What am I working on? What am I working on? Aside from classes? Right. All day, all night? All day, um, all night. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you, I've been trying to work on a story about Presley. She's a character in Trace. And mm. she is psychic. Sorry. Not a, but she's not your psychic. She's not, not psychic. Not psychic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, but I've been working on a story about her. I wanted to do a story about a fairy godmother. And I was told, that's too young. But I'm going to get it in there. Get it. Love it. I'll get in there. But I'm working on a story about her and trying to put in some of my own background in there because okay. my dad was military, so we grew up all over the place. And I never went to the same school twice until I got to like 11th grade. Yeah. So it was always, you're always the new kid. It's always a new environment. And I'm trying to put some of that in there um, because in Trace, there's a group of kids and I want her to feel like at last I'm someplace I want to stay. I know I have friends now. I want to stay here. I don't want to move. And she's also older. Yeah. She's now like 12, 13. So she's old enough to put her foot down and, and try and influence her parents to just stay. Nice. So I'm working on that. But you know what? I had seen this Yale Dr. Rowe quote a long time ago. And it's so true that writing is like driving at night in the fog. And all you can see is what's right in front of your headlights. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he phrased it much more eloquently, but that's it. So I can just see what's in front of the headlights. Yeah. You know? I used to think you have to have everything all plotted out when I was working with Sheila mm -hmm. because we were co-working. I felt like we needed to have a plot line and an outline of everything that was going to happen in the story. Uh, and then I was talking to um, another author and she was like, no, you know, sometimes she knows where she's going and she lets the characters just pull her along. Right. I find that that is true. That's one reason why I think when you're talking about doing um, a middle grade novel and you're saying it's difficult or whatever, or if you say, you should never say, I can't do it. Right. No, I can do it. It just you hurts. You can do it. <laughs> um, there's a couple of things that I found that are really helpful. One, one, okay. form a writer's group. Do you have a writer's group? I do not. I'm an only child. It does not play well with others. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. I was anti-writers group for the longest time. I was like, who needs a writers group? We don't, ah, right. yeah, we don't need to hear. And then I went to a writers group meeting. Mary and Dane Bauer, a million years ago up at Vermont College, um, had this right. And I was like, this is fabulous. Because people come with not just ideas, but responses. The thing is, we are in, Shadra, a communications business. Yes, we are. One does That's communicate. Pictures. I communicate with pictures. Not a lot of words. I don't have to say much. <laughs> but even if you're communicating with pictures, yeah, somebody's receiving it. Right. So somebody has to be on the other end who's like either getting it or not getting it. For sure. And it helps to have like a group around you who says, I get this, I don't get this, or tell me more about that, or I don't get why that happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's really helpful. The other thing that I found happened, which was what I knew is what I needed. I needed a gun to my forehead to do anything that is not under contract. Mm -hmm. you know, even if it's under contract, shh, you know, if right. they have, to have a gun. But um, with this group having to meet once a month, literally the mm -hmm. night before the meeting, I'm up, brrr, you know, at the yeah. keyboard trying to get it together enough to take into the next meeting. Yeah. And that's the only way the story got done is just yeah. to push yourself one little step at a time. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've been carving out spaces. So for the novel in verse, I wrote for a grant through um, my university and got it and was going to do the highlights poetry. And I'm like, if I, if I go to a group and I sit down and write it, the thing will get done. And so I'm still looking forward to that once we get past this big situation that we're in now. But 
for me, even with Jump In, like I was stuck on the sketches for so long and did an unworkshop at Highlights and got a first draft done. So thank you, Allison and George, <laughs> for making that happen. Was that the one thing that just turned it around? I mean, just having that time to yourself? I think so. Or giving myself, like making this the place and the time where I'm going to sit with no interruptions and do it. And it wasn't, it was a first draft. So a lot of things changed, but it was something that I was able to be in conversation with my editors with after that, you know? And so then I went back and it was a little easier to, to go through the edits, but yeah, man, it's tough. How do you? <laughs> oh, you know what? I gotta say, I took uh, my writer's group to highlights for nice. one of the fun workshops. It was fabulous. They want to go back. Because if, if people don't know, you go out there, first of all, you're in the, the woods-ish, yeah. mm -hmm. you're in a cabin, mm -hmm. you have to work. Mm -hmm. They give you fabulous meals. You see, I go back to the food. Yeah, same. These, 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 the meals are incredible. There's snacks all over the place. Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> Ice cream cooler, 24-7. S'mores, <laughs> bad, bad. <laughs> but all, aside from all of that, you're there in the woods with other people who are like-minded and are working on their books. So when you do come down for meals, it's, you can talk about the process. Yeah. You can talk about things that help you really unstick yeah. if you're stuck on a plot, you yeah. know, a plot point or something. There are bears. Nobody ever wants to talk about the bears. There are no bears, Pat. I have not seen a bear since I've been, I've been going there for years now. I don't know. No, they're bears. I know they're bears. People have seen bears. I have not seen bears. Nobody makes a point of it except for me, but they're bears. I thought the bears would leave me alone. There's also yoga. There's yes. also yoga. Yeah. You get a lot done. Um, and you do need something like that, a, a fixed time or place. I know that there are authors who, and writers and illustrators who say, I'm going to get up and I'm going to work from X amount of time, you know, like nine to 12 and I'm going to have lunch. I'm not that organized. Well, what's, your, do, yeah, what's your working schedule? This is, <laughs> that, this got ugly fast. Okay. I, I tend to. Bad. I didn't mean to come for you like that. <laughs> <laughs> Shots <Okay>. fired. <laughs> I, I tend to work uh, if left alone, which is what's happening now. Uh -huh. I work until I fall asleep. Okay. I get up and I work until I fall asleep. And my husband does the same thing. Chuku's the same way. So we don't really have hours. We never have. Yeah. Well, I usually like left to my own devices or work to five or six in the morning, sleep till about noon and get up and start. Oh, come on. Ugh. It's quiet. It's really nice and quiet. Uh -uh. Nobody bothers you at five in the morning. Okay. Three in the morning. I love that time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you? I, I, I'm an early riser, so I can't work into the morning, but I can get up at five in the morning and work through the afternoon. But my, my typical hours, I like to be up at like seven. And then I usually burn the morning with like exercise or emails or whatever, you know, and then I like to be at the desk at nine o'clock. So I like to keep business hours. Um, it's not necessarily the most productive. Some days are more productive than others, but I'll take a lunch break at like one o'clock and sometimes it drifts into three o'clock just depending on the energy. And then I work, uh, the latest I typically work is like 11 o'clock. If I'm like close to being finished with a book, I can push through to like two in the morning, but I, I need my sleep. I can't. Mm -mm. <laughs> oh, I, like, I like the sleep. You know, but, so, so you have kind of a routine that you follow when you're yeah. working. Do yeah. you do that with your books as well? Do you start like on page one and work your way through page 32? No, that I don't do. I, I typically for a book, I try to do a page that I know I can nail without a lot of stress. And so that just gives me a good start into the long marathon. Um, and I jump all over the place and that's emotional response. Like, what do I feel like suffering with for a week or a week and a half or two weeks? So what about you? Do you do one through 32? Or yeah, you it's very scattershot. It's whichever one feels like, you know, yeah. appealing. and then I'll work on several at a time because I might get bored with one and like move to another or it's very visceral and yeah. I find like I cannot write or even draw with distraction. Okay. You know I, mean? I, I can have some music on maybe in the background, but no television or anything like that. But when it comes to painting, anything can go on because it's, it's all gut. You know what I mean? It's like you're painting red and all of a sudden you need some olive green. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I might need some olive green and then suddenly think about another page that I was doing that needs some olive green too and go grab that. Yeah. Here's the thing. Two people. One, I've seen Diane Dillon's, uh, how Diane and Leo would work, right? Diane will have like the desktop is so organized. The paints are clean. Mm -hmm. They're all lined up on the side. She can start at the top left-hand side of the page and work her way 
down and across. And she said that's because her and Leo have passing it back. They had to be organized, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Sure. But then by accident, not by accident, I saw James Ransom's studio. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> My husband said to her, to him, you know, it's she shouldn't have seen this. She should not have seen this. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like the studio of life. It's his uh -huh. whole garage. But he has his entire book up. He has like uh these, uh, not shelves, but little brads or something along the wall. So you uh -huh. can put the entire book up and see it all at the same time, which is what you really need. Yeah. You need to be able to see it. So I put up like a humongous board and yeah. I will pack all the pages up there so I can yeah. see like the characters are staying the same or yeah. there's too much similarity here or this palette is shifting or whatever. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's yeah. what I'm working. That's what? That's that's when I'm working. Uh -huh. <laughs> in my head, in my head, those boards are going up all the time. Uh huh. You know, uh -huh. I but, get that. Um, but at the moment, I'm I'm only working on the the story about Presley. Okay. And, and there's a um, another story that I'm working on a picture book that I'm I can't get it I can't get it to move. I can't get it to move. One of these days, I gotta I gotta show you something though. Okay. Uh, this this uh, last book that I did, the last picture book, um, Where Is Mommy? Uh huh. I do want to share something. I want to share how that came about. Okay. And I, it's like a cautionary tale. <laughs> cautionary <laughs> tale for others. If I can do, um, if I can do uh, screen sharing now, this is going to get dicey, okay? I'm going to warn everybody, things could explode. <laughs> it could just go pop and then we're all, we're all dead. Okay, so what I want to show you was this. Hold it open. You see that? Yes. Okay, so I had this idea to do a... Um, book about parents that were missing because a friend of mine came to visit and brought um, her little daughter mm -hmm. and her granddaughter who was about four or five years old. This was Eva. Okay. Sweet little girl. Mm -hmm. Sweet little girl. And when they were leaving, because they're from England, when they were leaving, her dad gave her his phone number and said, put this in your shoe. When we get to Kennedy airport, if you get lost, <laughs> give my phone number to the policeman and he'll find me. And she said that she did not need a policeman because she had this drawing that she had done of her parents. <laughs> and so the policeman could just find her parents based on that. And it occurred to me just from that, that um, from a kid's point of view, she's not lost. It's her parents who'd be lost, right? Right. Here was the mistake, not the mistake. Here's, here's the cautionary tale. I showed this to an editor and told her I wanted to do this book about a little girl who thought her parents were missing you know, her parents were lost. And she was like, yeah, let's do this. This was a holiday house. And she said, let's do this. And I was like, okay. And um, she said, what's the story? Well, there was no story. <laughs> I, I, had, I had the drawing, that's all I had. And so um, Grace basically um, was the midwife on this and, and turned it into a book because it would not have happened without her. I, I went out and I got, oh, that's just some um, pictures. But um, I actually put this kid to work because once I started on the book, I wanted to make it like clues about, um, uh oh, clues about where her um, mother had gone. Yeah. And she was finding her clothes and her slippers and her eyeglasses and stuff. And so Grace said it would be really interesting to have as a um, end paper all the clues a little girl finds. And I thought, how about we get the little girl to actually draw them? So it would be in the child's hand. Yeah. Thinking of ways to make the kid work and not me have to do sure, another page. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so I got Eva, she was five at this time, to draw these slippers and I gave her a hard time. I was calling her and be like, that sweater is supposed to be green. It's not supposed to be all these different colors and I need it in two weeks and you need to hurry up because this thing is due. <laughs> <laughs> this is a five-year-old's drawing though? That's so good. It's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah. Um, but keep, keep in mind that at this point in time, I realized I was tormenting a five-year-old who had to get uh -huh. to kindergarten. You they got to learn, though. They got to learn. They start them early. <laughs> but I used it like this. So that when she's finding all these clues, um, I only use the mother part because it's her mom that's missing. Okay. Okay. And so I only use the mother part. But I just got to say, the, what I learned from that, okay, was that A, you don't torment little kids. You don't do that. I don't know how to, how do I stop sharing? Yes. Okay.
You always, I've always admired your sense of color. Like your sense of color is just amazing. Like fortunately, um, I've had the honor of being in your studio space and seeing your work and your paints that are all very beautifully put out. I'm like, how, how, how do you, what, how? I keep mine in bowls. It's like Dixie bowls and they're all just kind of spread all over the place. <laughs> Neither here nor there. I just, how do you think about color? Like where do you think your color sensibility has come from and developed? I don't know. I, you know what? I'm like what we were talking about earlier. I'm so influenced by other people. Mm -hmm. I'll see something. And so when I am working, I'll have on my desk, not just referenced, mm -hmm. you know, um, for what I'm drawing, but color swatches, things that I've seen. And it can be anything. It can be a portrait of a house there, you know, um, pictures of, of uh, flowers or you know, people's clothes or anything like that. But if I see some color combinations that I really like, I think I'm going to use that. There have been very few books that I set out to think of as a color statement. Yeah. Like I know Kay Yoon, I was using her work in class, Kay Yoon Yu, um, mm -hmm. as an example of how a control palette, how effective it can be, because uh, she works that way a lot of times. And when I first met her and she had done Little Red Fish, um, it was so limited. The palette was so limited. I was like, I don't know, but it was so elegant, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm always drawn to the idea that you can do something with a controlled color. The only book I ever did that with was C is for City, where okay. I gave myself an assignment on each page. So like, this will be the yellow page. Mm -hmm. This will be the blues and purple page. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I actually gave myself an assignment. And the truth is for everybody, I tend to think we need to do that. We need to give ourselves some sort of a challenge for every piece. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was the only book that I really felt like is a color challenge. Yeah. So yeah. let's see if we can make up a color challenge for the audience. What, what would be your color challenge assignment for everyone? Ah, my color challenge assignment. I love the way you throw these balls very quickly and hard. These are hard balls. <laughs> I, know, I forgot. Well, I forgot to come up with an assignment this week. <laughs> we were ooh, to ooh, I'm going to tell. Um, but no, actually, I think a color challenge would be a great thing to do because we're all, we've all had to shift gears. Yeah. And I have a feeling that emotionally things have changed radically in the last couple of weeks because we're all being, you know, squeezed yeah. in one way or another. Um, and so I think maybe the color challenge today would either be to fight against it or to go with it, you know what I mean? To say the um, the lockdown colors. Okay. What do you think of when you're when you're in lockdown? But what do you think of when you're thinking of breaking out? Okay. What you, like two opposing kind of palettes. I like that. Let's you make know? a let's make it a hefty assignment then. So both of those. But but it also should have like a twist and a surprise. Do you know okay. what I mean? It's like if you if I think when people think about internalizing things and being locked down, you think about somber dark colors. Right. Um, but what about a surprise to that? You okay. know, what about, what about that one little ray of light in there? What kind of an image could you get where you have that ray of light where light becomes such an important factor? Yes. I like, I'm writing this down. I love it. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, it just, it, somebody, um, actually, mm. actually, was it somebody, uh, it was somebody from class last night. Oh my goodness. Could it have been Ashley? because I see Ashley's on there, um, did a piece that had this one ray of light streaming across a darkened um, setting. Okay. And I thought that was really effective, really effective. Yeah, okay. I like it. Hmm. So maybe an illustration depicting a ray of hope. Can we say that? A ray of hope. A okay. ray of hope. And maybe you know what? Think no, about just say, lighting is huge. Lighting is huge. It's the kind of thing that lifts your work out of the pile. Yep. When editors and art directors are looking at these promotional pieces that people send in, the elements that they are looking at are what makes your work unlike everybody else's. And okay. lighting is going to be a huge one because a lot of people don't worry about it. They just yeah. give you full frontal lighting. Yeah. So how about we limit the palette to four colors or five colors? Should we be gracious and say five? I like four because it's like three colors with a bolt of light. Yeah. Four. Right. four colors. That's your challenge. Four colors and a ray of hope. Boom. My oh, bam. <laughs> do we have questions? <laughs> yes, we do have questions. And we'll review your challenge at the end. <laughs> we go. That was a great challenge, though. A long thought out, well developed. Right. We coordinated several meetings to get to that challenge. <laughs> How it goes. How it goes. So I'm going to try and get to, to as many questions here as possible. Um, I'll probably focus in on the ones that are directed to the two of you first and then kind of go from there. Um, so one of the questions is, 
Can Pat and Shadra share their favorite mediums? Also, what is procreate, which was asked like 75 times. So there you I go. You procreate. <laughs> my, my iPad. Okay, I'm going to walk you back into this. I movie. need procreate. We all have, we're all going to learn it sooner or later. This is kind of like, uh, you know, what is that invasion of the body snatchers? You fall asleep and you wake up and you're one of them. Look at that. She's on her rolling chair. Are you on your rolling chair? <laughs> I'm walking. <laughs> oh, you're walking. Back to my studio. I hope my internet stays. So procreate is an iPad app. Um, and similar to Photoshop, it will allow you to, um, just draw and paint in layers. I don't have anything. Let's see. One of these sketches, it would be easier if I was able to airdrop this to you, um, or whatever. What can I do? So there you can see all the layers, um, just like in Photoshop and draw and paint, but it's essentially, um, drawing with an Apple pencil, which is back that directly on the screen. So kind of like a Cintiq, which is a larger surface screen that's digital that you can use Photoshop with. But it's just, it's cheaper. It's like 30 bucks for Procreate. Um, you, it works with Photoshop um, and it allows me to work on my couch. <laughs> but my favorite medium is still like watercolor and gouache. I love watercolor and gouache. Me too. Yeah. Watercolor, gouache, and then some pencil and maybe some pastel. Yeah. And a little bit of ink. <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing. You know, when you were talking about my palette being laid out and my watercolors being laid out, I do not differentiate between watercolor and gouache. I know that that's like a crime to mix them. I know, right? It's like color. <laughs> I mix it all in there. They're just all laid out together. I don't know which is which. Um, I mix them up together. And then 4 o'clock in the morning, if I need yellow, and all I got is a crayon, it's going to be yellow crayon. Do you know what I mean? I do. So I, I like to mix my mediums. Yeah. Yeah. I mix them, but with what works for me, like, so with your paint, like your work is still really, I would say that it's mostly gouache when I look at it. Right. Which is because of the opacity. And for me, mine is mostly watercolor. <laughs> so I just use gouache when I need a little bit of structure. If I want some opacity that I'm just not going to get with watercolor. So yeah, I, I work with them, but not as interchangeably, I think. Yeah. Well, with watercolor, you kind of have to know what you're doing. Do you? so i was you know if you if you held any of my pieces because mine are very analog they're very old school if you hold my artwork to the light it is like seven inches thick in some places okay because i just keep painting on top of stuff and if it ain't working i'll put some acrylic on it and paint on top of that See, for me, I'll start it, and if I ruin it early on, I'll throw it away and start over. So there are pages that I've done like eight times because mm -hmm. I want this sort of delicateness that I can't do if I keep layering and layering. So I have to be ready to, to kill my babies. <laughs> you, know, you know what I found? And this I learned from Mike Curato. He came to class, and he was showing how he did his work, and he was showing little um, Elliot in the big city mm -hmm. and all the layers. <coughs> and I got so inspired. <coughs> I went home and I said, I'm going to do a Mike, a, a Mike Garato, you know, mm -hmm. and I did it for like this Beatrix Potter compilation I was doing. Just start the painting, scan it in, work on it in Photoshop, yep. print it out, work on it some more and just keep, I mean, going back and forth. It yeah. hadn't occurred to me until then to go back and forth interchangeably between digital and, um, and, you know, hand drawn stuff. Yeah. Yeah, true digital is what I like to call it. True digital. That's what you meant by true digital. That's my trademark. Oh. You can use that. <laughs> I'm writing it down, Shadow. Yes. yes. Okay, true digital. Design a straighter is another one that you can oh, use. My goodness. <laughs> I love it. That was be your introduction. <laughs> Let's try and get to two more. Just two more. We're going to try. Right. One of the questions, uh, well, several of the questions are about book covers, mm -hmm. and some of them are about getting book cover jobs, but mm -hmm. others are ideas um, between uh, the way that you work on a book cover versus the way that you work on uh, a story itself. Mm -hmm. Book covers are faster, thank God, <laughs> and it's not that different. You know, it's still loose sketch. I'll throw some color in there so that my um, editors can take it to marketing. So the biggest thing with a book cover is marketing has a, a bigger say in what you're doing than just your art director and your editor. Um, but in terms of the process <laughs> of making, there isn't that much difference um, other than you have like, you know, the, you have to work within the frame of the book, the book size, so you don't have as much visual real estate 
you don't have the turning of the page. So you have to solve a lot in one shot without giving everything away and sort of making it evocative and having someone want to pick it up off the shelf. Um, and you have to leave much more room for typography in your book cover, right? Like it's not about you as the artist so much. It's about being able to see the book from across the room and wanting to come pick it up. Um, how do you get a book cover job? It, it's happened organically. I didn't start getting book covers until people knew me as an illustrator and um, asked. <laughs> but I mean, if, you, if you want to do book covers, I would have the so, samples like that in your portfolio. Like a good assignment for yourself would be to um, take a book that's well known, well, or maybe not even well known, but an older book, like much older, like think 19 older and um, illustrate the cover, you know, and set the type and have that in your, in your portfolio. I would say exactly the same thing. I would say you take a classic, something that everybody already knows the narrative, Lord of the Flies, something like that, because if they can see how you think um, when you do a jacket and how you'd bring something to it, um, the next person wouldn't, then it'll be striking. But I think Shadra's point is really the key thing to keep in mind. It has to be something that would pull somebody across the room. The mm -hmm. cover has to draw them in and tell enough, but not too much of the story. Yeah. Enough to be provocative, give yeah. a sense of what's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So our last question, um, several people asked about grants for writers and illustrators. Both of you work um, in lots of different organizations. You work with students and perhaps you yourself have even applied for some grants or um, as a writer, as an illustrator. Um, what's out there and, and what are your experiences like with, with that? Oh. Never gotten a grant, never applied for one. <laughs> so that's coming. <laughs> well, I, I teach at um, MICA at Maryland Institute College of Art and they offer faculty grants for projects that you're working on. And so you just apply and it's um, essentially, um, I show some samples and give a little bit of information about who I am and my history working in the industry and um, talk a bit about the project to um, how, how will it contribute to your field in an interesting way. So that's through MICA, but through like our organizations, SCBWI offers lots of grants for works in progress. I know the Highlights Foundations offers grants and scholarships for people coming um, to workshops and things like that. So I would start with your, your, your book organizations, whatever the organizations are that you're already active with, like research a little bit and look for grants within the kid lit community. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Any other nice questions? Job. <laughs> Any other questions? There are several other questions. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to get to them all, but- um, Can I put one thing in? Yes, of okay. course. Okay. Um, because for illustrators, I always think this is the best thing to do on the planet, if you want to send out your promotional cards, to get a hold of the catalog. This one from the last original art show, mm -hmm. apparently they don't have it in the store. They do have um, last year's, they have the 2018 catalog, which I think is kind of odd, but they have the 2018 catalog. And the reason that I'm saying that that's a really wonderful thing to get a hold of is it's the only place that I know of where you can find the name of the editor and the art director for a particular book all in one spot. Mm -hmm. And when you're sending your artwork in, you're sending your promotional card into someplace, it's really a good idea to focus on editors who are, you know, publishing books by illustrators that you really love their work. Mm -hmm. So if you see a book that you love, 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 the person behind that book is an editor and an art director who might share the same taste that you have. So it might come that, through. Pat, what's, what's the catalog? It's the original art show as Society okay. of Illustrators. Um, I'll put a link into the chat for um, the store because they have a, um, uh, where's the link? This is for their most recent catalog. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, which the one that they're selling now is a 2018 one. They don't seem to have the 2019 one available. But the reason I'm saying that is because when you open it up, you'll see all these books uh, in the bookstore that you love. And those are the people I think that you should go after. And it'll tell you like the name of the art director and the editor. And the reason um, I think it's really important to do the research and to find recent books, 2019, 2020, is because these editors and art directors move around a lot. Mm -hmm. So when you're sending your cards out, sending it to a person instead of just a generic 
art department kind of a thing helps, particularly if, you, if you're in love with a particular book that they did. If you send it to, um, if, say, Matthews, Poco and the Drum, if you love Poco and the Drum and you send it to that editor and you say, I happen to really love that book, that editor knows that you did a little bit of research. It's not generic. You're not just, you know, throwing spaghetti at the ceiling. Yeah. Um, it's focused. And then you're also not landing on the desk of people who publish books that you think suck. Right. Terrible. We don't think that about anybody's books. We don't think that about anybody's books. <laughs> no. <laughs> but you do have favorites. And so I think you've got to go for the top ones first, you know, the people you would love to work with first, mm -hmm. and the ones who share your taste. Yeah. Hopefully. So the, the assignment was four colors. You're limiting yourself to four colors, and it is what? A ray of hope. So you're thinking about lighting, and you're limiting your palette to four colors. That's your assignment. And you can share uh, on social media using the hashtag HFGather or share it with that Highlights Bound or uh, hashtag Highlights Bound to uh, get it out into the world. I do have a little bit of commentary, Pat. First thing, we have not lost any authors or illustrators to bears yet at the Highlights Bound. <laughs> yet. Second thing, I want you to feel comfortable knowing that Kent is keeping a close eye on the ice cream cooler and okay. checking it regularly while no one else is out there. Mm -hmm. um, and really third, I can't wait to see James Ransom's studio. Maybe we can get him to show us his studio. Oh, uh, we do have, I think Mike Corrado is your guest next week, right, Shadra? Or maybe you don't even know the answer to that yet. <laughs> <laughs> what, is he coming over? What's happening? <laughs> I think Mike Corrado will be our guest next week or the week after. Um, <laughs> yes. And uh, if, you, if you're joining us on Monday for our Monday meditation with Lori Kalkovan, that's at 10 a.m. Um, and Nikki Grimes is joining Sarah Aronson Wednesday, and that is at 1 p.m. That's a different time from our normal session. Mm -hmm. um, finally, if you like this session and you are able please make a small donation to the Highlights Foundation. Uh, you can uh, find that on our website, uh, highlightsfoundation.org. Uh, we have a donate button there. We also have in our workshop listings, all of the HF Gather sessions that we'll be hosting over the next couple of weeks that you can register for. Those are all my notes. Thanks so much, Shadra and Pat, for sharing this with us. I've uh, been just smiling and laughing away and enjoying my time. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Good Thanks seeing you, George. Bye, Thank you both so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Shadra. Great seeing you.